Well, Pastor Debbie tried to crack the crowd. That didn't work. Pastor Mike tried to crack the crowd. That didn't work. So I'm just going to crack the crowd. All right. So don't don't be intimidated by a laptop. It's just last night I put most of my stuff on here and I haven't had time to print it. So for all you Mac haters, Josh, too bad. Ha- hatred is of the devil. You do know that, right? All right. So I'm just going to try and get into this. Thank you for water. Um, so yeah, I've, I've known that I'm speaking for about three weeks. That's about three weeks. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I had a couple ideas of what I wanted to talk about. And for the camera lady, I'm just going to be honest with you. I can't stand in one place. It's <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fidgety. I'm like that. So yeah, I tried, I tried to prep on certain things. And it just seemed like the last three weeks... Nothing could possibly go right. Uh, it's just, it's impossible, you know. Um, so up until yesterday, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. I just really didn't feel comfortable with it. And uh, on my way home last night, uh, I was like, okay, God, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this topic whatsoever, clearly. It's just not sitting right. So um, I'm going to throw it out the window at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, what are we doing? And the last three weeks for me, I don't know about you guys, but the last three weeks for me have been incredibly frustrating. Like I said, nothing was going right. Work just seemed to drive me up the walls, you know, just dealing with all kinds of stuff everywhere. So just being frustrated last night, I was like, God, you know, you know where I'm at. You, just, you know where I'm at. What are we doing? <laughs> you know, and God was just started talking to me about David. Just started talking to me about David. And, you know, just, we all, when we think of David, we instantly think... You know, the man that killed Goliath, the man that was king, you know. We think of the incident, you know, all all the things that David did through his life. But God really had me go back to the absolute beginning when Samuel went and anointed David to be king. So, you know, the the thing that hit me the most, I I was reading it in 1 Samuel 16. I hope you guys have your Bible. Does anyone not have a Bible? Pastor Debbie says she has an extra one. So, first person to grab Pastor Debbie's Bible. (laughs) My Bible is NIV. I don't really like it. (laughs) Um, I I lost my beautiful New King James black leather bound Bible. I'm I'm, I'm waiting on God. No, no, it's a specific one. I'm waiting on God to bring it back. So, So, I went online and found the New King James Version and put it on my laptop, hence why my laptop is here. So 1 Samuel, I'm going to start over at verse 6. Before I get started, I'm just going to paint the picture a little bit. Um, Saul has now fallen out of favor with God. He's just disobeying. And God has decided, you know what, I'm going to replace this king. And so he, he tells Samuel, he's like, you know, I have chosen one of the kids of Jesse, and I want you to go, you know, just go to Jesse and, you know, anoint uh, the new king, the future king. So Samuel's like, yeah, but if Saul finds out, I'm a dead man. So, you know, God being God, it's like, well, take a young cow with you and say you're going to sacrifice. and You want Jesse and his sons to come with you. Now, Samuel would be the equivalent of, I don't know, maybe a modern day Benny Hinn or something like that. Just, just a real man of God that when you hear his name, you're like, whoa, it's Samuel. <laughs> My God, you know, like a modern day Tim man. <laughs> hey, you know. Just one of those men that you would be honored just to be standing around. Like, hey, this is a man of God. This is awesome. You know? And when he comes to your town, it's one thing. When he comes to your house, it's another. You know? And so Samuel was on his way to see Jesse and uh, tells Jesse, listen, I want to sacrifice with your family. Like, let's let's go up and sacrifice this young cow and, you know, we'll do it together. And at the same time, I'm going to anoint one of your sons as king. You know, just on the side note, in case no one knows. So that's, that's... the storyline, but before they're going up, you know, Samuel figures, I'm going to anoint the future king now. So verse 6 says, um, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the, Lord anointed, uh, the Lord's anointed uh, is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see, uh, does not see what man sees, but the look, uh, excuse me, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. To give you a little bit of an idea of what Eliab probably looked like, hey, Josh, want to come up here? (laughs) 
I've, I've, I've been spending time with Josh for the last two days. I'm going to pick on him now. Josh, I want you up here. <laughs> Tall dude. Tall, big, strong dude. <laughs> I'm going to pay for this later, aren't I? <laughs> now, in total honesty, now, you can stay there. Whoa! If Eliab had to be anything, it would probably be like Josh. Tall, strong, you know, looks like he's imposing, you know, just the type of man that you would look at, this can be king. Like, I, this would probably be a good king. Think about it. You know, it's very manly, very manly. That's your job. You got to keep him level. You're his wife. Keep him level. <laughs> so, you know, you look at him and you're like, wow, yeah, that, that could probably be king. And then God turns around and says, no, go sit down. Oh, yeah. You're refused. You didn't read? You didn't hear? <laughs> I'm going to pay for this so bad later. So, yeah, you know, we look at things, we're like, yeah, man, that could possibly, that, that would be king. Look at that. Tall guy, strong. You know, yeah, I can see that. And God's like, uh, no. And for a second, I could just imagine Simon going, uh, what? No. Okay. All right, maybe there's another one. You know, and Jesse had seven sons pass before Samuel, before David. All of them. I couldn't imagine my mom having eight versions of me. I couldn't. It, it would probably be the worst thing on the planet. <laughs> one version of me drove her up the walls. I couldn't imagine eight. So, seven passed before Samuel, and every single one, God's like, no, no, no. So, I can imagine Samuel at this point is probably like, man, like, God, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, these guys are tall. They're imposing. They're men. They're men. Man. Pastor Mike. And every single one of them, God's like, no, I'm sorry, no. Not fit to be king. So it gets to the point where Samuel is looking, and there's no more, you know, no more sons around him. And he looks at Jesse, he's like, is this it? Like, do you have any more? And Jesse's like, yeah, there's, there's one more, but he's out there watching the sheep. Don't worry about it. It's not... Now, let me just tell you something. If a man of God, of Samuel's stature, is coming over, I know, because I, I, I've had real men of God come over and spend the time at our house, and my parents would make sure that I'd be home. My parents, you're not missing this. You're not. And here's David. Here's the man of God. Shows up at your house, and David's not there? What does that say about how the father looks at David? Think about that. So David, David was probably the rejected one. You know, his brothers were all going to the army. They're all big men. They're all going to be at war, which was what you did back then. You're either a shepherd or a warrior if you're a man. And you wanted to be a warrior because shepherds were just, you know, you're not a man. You can't throw a spear. <laughs> at least that's what I think it was. So David probably did feel rejected. Probably the insignificant one, lost among seven other brothers. It's very easy to get lost. And here's Samuel, and he shows up. He's like, is there any, you know, do you have any others? Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's David. He's out there. Just don't worry about David. He's too small and insignificant to really, to really be of any consequence. And Samuel is like, no, no, just bring him. Just bring him. Bring them all. So they call out for David. David comes. And lo and behold, God's like, yeah, that's the one I want. The Bible says that David was a good-looking guy, ready, you know, like a shepherd would be. Just one of those guys that's outdoor, you know, not, not perfectly formed, but no one cares. Here's a little scrawny kid, and Samuel's like, yeah, this, this is the king. And I'm telling you, last night I was reading this at 11 o'clock, and I've read this thing about a million times. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, here's a kid that was rejected by his parents, and I know what it's like to feel rejected. I know what it's like to feel insignificant, to feel like you're just not part of the crowd, you're not part of anything. And here's David, God's like, no, you're the one I want. And so you start thinking, well, what, what did God see? Because God's like, I'm not looking at the outward appearance, I'm looking at the heart. So what did God see? And the more I started reflecting a little bit on David's life, David was a shepherd, he was alone with sheep, and at times, they'd be gone for days. You know, and he'd have to sleep outdoors. With, with his sheep and he'd have to encounter things like lions and bears and later on David does talk about that but the one thing we do know about David 
is he was a true worshiper. You read the Psalms, you read what David wrote, and the reality of David's heart is evident in black and white. You see all the praises that he has, and then you see all the frustrations that he has. But in the midst of his frustration, he's still praising. And so the more I'm thinking about this, I'm like, man, David, David, you know, the warrior, David the king, was also David the boy and David the rejected. But he found something. See, it was those, those moments when he was alone, those moments when nobody was around, those moments when it was, it's just him and God, David found something. There was something in the secret place that David was like, hey, this part of God that I just discovered is absolutely incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And the more time went on, the more that he was in relationship with God, the deeper he went. You know, things like bears, lions, wolves, eh, that's whatever, secondary. It's secondary. Actually, in chapter 17, verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I love this part, I went after it. He didn't count it lost, he went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion, the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. The secret place when no one's around. Can I ask you, what what are you guys doing when no one's around? What are we doing? What are we discovering about God in our secret place? Uh, When did we have band practice for youth? Like a couple weeks ago? No? And we had sort of like a youth band meeting right after practice. And the one thing I told them is like, if you're not having a life of worship at home, Mm -hmm. it's going to show when you get up there. You can't hide it. You can't hide it. It's not some form of performance. They'll know. You know, we came back from Fresh Wind, and they're all like, man, how how do we be like Corey Asbury and his band? How do we free flow like that? Well, that's very simple. What are you doing in your, your quiet time? Are you free flowing? Are, is your heart open? Are you vulnerable? Are you there? Are you engaging with God? What happens in the secret place is very evident in public. David, what he did in his secret time, in his alone time, is very evident. I love it because what, what he discovered about God, you know, if we go to chapter 17, verse 26. Goliath is threatening the Philistine, uh, threatening Israel, threatening the Philistines. Wow. <laughs> Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Once again, another line I love about David. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me tell you something. If you don't know God, that's not how you're talking. You want to know how I know? Look at the rest of the army. Nobody stepped up. Nobody stepped up. But David had... Listen, I'm I'm being honest. This is what hit me the most. David had found something in the secret place when nobody was around. When he was alone, he found something. There's just something about God that he got a grasp about. Maybe it was God is faithful. Maybe it's God is good. Maybe it's God is great. But he found something. There was a facet of God that David had discovered that nothing and nobody was going to shake. Not even a 12-foot giant. Sorry, Josh. (laughs) The more that you look at David, I mean, David was king. He had absolutely anything he wanted, snap of his finger. You know, just modern day, it would probably be a version of Bill Gates or something, just, or a president, or just take something to a country that financially is not falling apart. You know, snap your finger, and I've got it. But the more I look at David, I mean, Psalm 27, you know, verse 4 says, One thing I ask of the Lord. 
This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What did David find? What would make him say, better is one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere on this planet? And listen, this planet has a lot of beautiful places. We've seen the pictures. Some of us have visited the places. What could possibly make David say, better is one day in your courts? David had found something. David had found something, and nothing on this planet could shake it. See, David being a man after God's own heart is because David pursued God with all that he had. King or shepherd, David's one desire, it's straightforward, David's only desire was God. If God would have told him you're going to be a shepherd for the rest of your life, David would have been fine with that. Because David didn't care about a crown. David had one thing on his heart, God. He'd fallen in love so much with God. I guess the question is, where are we at? I say this because lately I've been talking to a lot of young people. I've been talking even with some adults, some friends, and it seems like everybody's in the middle of something. Everybody's in the middle of something. Everybody's currently facing a giant. Have you found what it takes? Have you found that facet of God that gets you through? Like I said, three weeks for me, the last three weeks have been beyond frustration. And when, when I realized this yesterday, it just it blew me away. It sort of brought me back to when I was younger and just hungry. Didn't care about people, didn't care about what was going on around me, didn't care about anything. There was just a reality of the presence of God that I had found and I just wanted it. And I'll be honest with you, along you know, a long life as life goes on, I seem to have lost a little bit of that. And last night was just like, Wow, yeah. I remember those moments. I remember those intense moments where it was like God like God was standing in the room. And it didn't matter if I had something to say. It didn't matter if I didn't. It just It was God and I just didn't care. So the question is, what are you finding in the secret place? I'm going to be real. Do some of us even have a secret place? Do some of us have a time where we can get lost with God? Wow, it's really quiet in here. Should I bring Josh up and make a few more cracks? I'm just being real. What we find in our quiet time with God, I promise you, you're falling more in love with Him than you could ever expect. I remember those days, just being in love with God. I never had anything to say because I always found what I had to say was insignificant in comparison to those moments alone with God. Words couldn't describe it. And what people did became insignificant became absolutely insignificant. See, David, when he went to go see his brothers and eventually killed Goliath, people were looking at him and saying, you? You're a scrawny little kid. Like, what are you going to do? We've got men three times your size or, you know, monsters, guys that are built, muscular. They can probably fling a spear from here halfway across the battlefield. What are you going to do? David didn't care. He was like, want to see? I know God better than you do. I know his heart. I know, I know him personally. I can hear him. I walk with him. It's very different. I guess this is just a call for going a little deeper. Can, can I ask an honest question where you guys actually answer me? How many are just tired of being where we're at? We're just tired of being where we're at. It, it becomes frustrating. I... I I was at a youth camp with one of our youth groups 
this is a while back, and um, the camp we had rented had like bike trails and all this stuff, and on the map it had five different levels of bike paths. So our youth leader was like, Jerem, you and one of my buddies named Sebastian, take the bikes, go up ahead, do level four, see if it's safe for the youth. If it's not, then we'll tell the youth, max you can do is level three. So level four, has, has anybody ever seen the X Games? It, it, it was the most painful experience. <laughs> we were going up hills, the slopes that were like, you know, just ridiculous. I mean, I remember getting off the bike and walking the slope, it was impossible. You know, going across little riverbeds on, on little planks of wood, or whatever you would find. And about halfway through, I mean, we, we just stopped. We were dead. We we're like, okay, that's it. We're resting. Just stop. And I remember I was, I was so thirsty, and I was about to just stick my head in the riverbed and just drink away. And my buddy grabs my shoulder and goes, don't, don't drink that. So I'm like, okay, why? And he was taking nuclear medicine, so he knew what he was talking about. He's like, you see that red tint in the water? That's mercury. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so we started looking around, and there was a little lake. It wasn't flowing anywhere, and there was one tree dead center in the middle of the lake. Dead. And we're looking at each other, and he looked at me and goes, Mercury probably did that. Probably just took the life right out of the tree. And the one thing I got from that was simple. If you stay in one place too long, it'll kill you. You'll get frustrated. You'll get torn apart. What was good becomes poison. And I understand we're all frustrated. We're all frustrated with where we're at. I know I am. So I guess it's a call for going a little deeper. I ask this question all the time, especially to the youth band <coughs> and to the guys. I mean, Josh, Josh hears me say this all the time. How hungry are you? How far are you really willing to go? Not you, Josh. It's another Josh. How hungry are you? Behold, he enters the room. <laughs> Couldn't have timed that any better, Josh. <laughs> that, that's pretty much all I have to say. But just how deep, how far are we willing to go? How hungry are we? David got to know God to a point where nothing and no one could shake him. Despite his mistakes, he knew God. He had grasped the facet of God that was just, he had locked into it. So, where are we at? How far are we willing to go? What are we doing in our secret time, in our quiet time? I'm done. <laughs> this is a serious call this morning that has gone out. You see, frustration is that place where we are, but yet we see what's ahead, the ideal, and the frustration is everything in between. And many of us are there right now because our hearts are longing for what God has spoken what God has decreed and proclaimed, and yet we're in this place of where we seem to be spinning our wheels or things are coming against or all of these things, and we have to move from frustration to hunger. We have to move from dissatisfaction to hunger because the Bible says that he will fill those who are hungry. It does not say he will fill those who are dissatisfied. And there's a huge, huge difference between dissatisfaction and the place of frustration and being hungry for more. Being hungry, because the hunger will cause you to pursue. The frustration, the frustration will cause you to stay where you are and become even more frustrated, move into anger and bitterness, disillusionment. I mean, which sounds better? Hunger and pursuit or frustration and disillusionment. So we've heard a great word today. And the other thing that stands out is those who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And so the question is, do you have a secret place? 
Do you have a secret place? Do I have a secret place? And I'm hearing a lot of people talk about how they used to. Those times of being in God's presence, those times of being in the secret place where the eyes are open, the ears are open to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we are being called in this day to return to that secret place. We are being called to return to the presence of the Lord and to the word of the Lord. This is a good word, Jerem. A timely word, a very timely word. And what I'd like us to do this morning, for those of you who want, is just to find a place at this altar and rededicate yourself to the secret place. We're not going to have music. We're not going to have people praying over you. This is you and him. You and him, because you know what? Your relationship is about you and him. And I can't live it for you. I can't do the breakthrough for you. Right? There are moments and times for that, but, but I really feel today there is a call that has gone out that we need to respond to. And so I'm going to invite you this morning to come to this altar and just spend some time remembering the secret place and having that stirred up in your spirit again that God, by His Spirit, would reignite the hunger and the thirsting because let's face it, unless the Holy Spirit draws us into that place, we're not going to go. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's make ourselves available and yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit so that he can begin to draw us back into that secret place. And I love that. So that we can, again, see a facet of God. That we learn something that takes us through. Amen? So Father, we just give ourselves right now to your word and we say word be planted in our hearts be planted in our hearts and may our hearts be soil that receives that seed and that it goes deep and Father we just want to spend some time with you right now we want to come back into that place we want to move from grace to grace today Father we want to move into greater grace greater grace greater grace in Jesus name so I want to invite you this place is a, a sanctuary if you need to fellowship or speak I'm asking that you go into the fellowship hall I'm going to ask that as the children come that please have your children um, either stay in the fellowship hall right now but we want to take some time right now amen can we do that all right let's take some time and when you feel you know there, there's no um, moment where we're going to say this is finished. It's you and the Lord right now. And if you're watching by live stream, we're going to invite you as well. Take some time right now to spend with the Lord. Amen.